Night noises. It was just like it was when she slept in the same room as Lara. She'd lain there for what seemed like hours before she realized she was being kept awake by the night's noises. The air was steamy with an aphrodisiac. Every toad for miles was croaking its finest wooing song, and in the Alao house, crickets serenaded one another in harmonizing duets. It was the exact location of this noise that Bolande was trying to decipher when she realized she was fully clothed. She changed into her nightgown and got on her knees. She crawled along the walls and pressed the nozzle of the insect killer at the narrow gap between the wall and the wooden skirting board. She could taste the insecticide at the back of her throat. Yasegi's room was just a few yards down the corridor, and Bolande could hear her voice filtering through the walls into her room. It was angry, like the buzzing of a frustrated bee against a closed window. Bolande heard her name each time Iyasegi accused her daughter of shamelessness. Equally aggravating was Segi's silence at the end of every question, which seemed to cause her mother much frustration. It was only after her mother told her to go to her room that Segi opened her mouth. Do not be annoyed, Mama, she said. The words did not carry the remorse her mother was looking for. Just get out, Yasegi snapped. Yes, Mama. Bolande heard Segi shuffle out of her mother's bedroom. Around 2 a.m., a chilling scream pierced the silence in all the rooms of the house. It wasn't high-pitched, more like the sorrowfully low notes of a trombone, but it went on for an uncomfortable length of time. Bolande sat up with a jolt and leapt off her bed. She wrapped her cover cloth around her shoulders and raced out of her bedroom. Baba Segi, Iyafemi, Segi and Aki were all in the sitting room. Iyasegi was there too, but standing in the far corner, with her fist in her mouth, shivering. Black bra straps had fallen onto fat upper arms and her wrapper was bundled together around her waist. From where she was standing, all Bolande could see were Segi's feet, lying on the floor. They flexed and contracted as if she was in the throes of an epileptic fit. Her father was on his knees next to her, staring at her as if to absorb her pain. He kept touching her legs and arms, addressing her in a mix of prayers, pleas and promises. Don't leave me, my daughter. Don't let me mourn you. It is not the order of things in our world. Tell the gods you want to stay here with me. Tell them you are not ready to walk the path of the ancestors. Tell them there are those who love you here, in our world. Tell them that your father loves you. Tell them for me, Segi. My daughter, I will buy you gold. I will buy you the finest lace. First fruit of my loins. Do not disregard my words. It was a pitiful sight. His tears had created dark spots on Segi's nightdress. Iyasegi kept peeking at Segi from behind the head tie she had draped over her face. Iyatope ran into the room, carrying the shirt that matched the trousers Babasegi was wearing. Her entire front was covered in undigested chicken streaked with blood. A stench pursued her, but she wasn't bothered by it. She was entirely focused on retrieving the keys of the pickup from the nail. Bolani scanned the faces of all those present, but not one pair of eyes responded to her inquiring brow. Instead, they were wet with foreboding. Iyafemi sat in her armchair jiggling her foot. Her eyelids were heavy with sleep and resentment. Her children didn't get this much attention when they had a fever. Why did the entire household have to be disturbed on account of Segi's vomiting? She ate far too much anyway. It was when Iyatope and Aki carried Segi to the pickup that Bolale got a chance to see her face. She looked like she was sucking her cheeks in, like they'd been deflated. Every so often, a torrent of toddler-like gibberish escaped her throat. Her crooked fingers were drawn into semi-fists. Her palms looked as if the blood beneath the skin had receded into her wrists. Just before they bundled her into the pickup, her body was wrenched by a sudden urge to vomit. The force of it was so overpowering that she soiled herself. Babasegi settled himself into the driver's seat. Opting for lucidity over maternal unpredictability, he commanded Iyatope to get in and sit next to Segi. Watch over Iyasegi and the children, he shouted to Iyafemi before he drove off. Bolande went to the kitchen to fetch Iyasegi and Iyafemi some cold drinking water from the fridge. She brought out two glasses on a tray and presented one of them to Iyasegi. What have you done to my daughter? Answer me, witch! What have you inflicted on my daughter? Iyasegi grabbed Bolande by the sleeve, knocking the tray to the floor too. Mama, no! Aki shouted. Iyasegi turned to her son. If you don't want your mother to curse you, find your way to your bed now. With the boy out of earshot, she borrowed her nails deeper into Bolande's shoulder. I didn't do anything to her, Bolande shouted. She didn't know whether to wrench herself from Iyasegi's clutches or offer herself as a sacrifice. Iyafemi laid her head on the headrest of her armchair, put her feet on a footstool and folded her arms, watching. What did you say to her? What curses did you put on her? Yasegi's words were laced with garlic. She chewed six cloves every night as part of her constitutional maintenance. I didn't say anything to her. Why did you force her into your room then? My daughter has never kept secrets from me, but tonight she behaved as if she was born without ears. Tell me what you did to her. Yasegi, please, you are hurting me. Let me go to my room. Yasegi pushed Bolande with all the strength in her muscular arms. The smaller woman fell backwards and landed bottom first on a stool before toppling over and knocking her head on the cold tiles, just missing the edge of the rug. Although Bolande heard the sound of bone-grazing stone, she jumped to her feet in case Iyasegi decided to pounce. 
unstable on her feet, Balali touched the back of her head and brought her hand within view. It was moist with blood. Look what you have done to me, she whispered. At this, Iyafemi pointed at Bolanli, threw her head back and burst into peals of laughter. She held her belly and rocked on her seat. Then as suddenly as she started, she stopped. <laughs> what she has done to you? How lucky you are that Iyafegi did not decapitate you and pound your head in the mortar. You are indeed an evil spirit. Get thee behind us, Satan. Leave our home. Iyafemi flicked her wrists and shooed her. But what have I done to make you hate me? What have I ever done to hurt any of you? Ha! The exact words of the witch who was caught drying her hands after her neighbor's child was found floating in the compound well. Iyafemi paused. Sooner than you think, we will be rid of your evil spirit. Bolanli raised her hands. I don't understand this. One minute, you're giving me generous portions of chicken from your son's birthday celebrations. The next, you call me an evil spirit. What am I to make of all this? Which is it exactly? You will know soon enough. Don't be in a hurry, evil spirit. <laughs> Iyafemi let her laughter loose again. Then it is good that I did not eat it. I'm glad it was Segi who ate it all. I'm glad my lips did not touch food that was offered to me by hands that hate me. I am glad that... Iyasegi, who had slipped back into her trance, sat up. Did you say Segi ate your chicken? Yes, she wanted it and I let her have it. I am not full of hate. Why should I deprive her of anything when she is a child and my husband's daughter? Before they could humiliate her further, Bolale ran to her bedroom and locked the door behind her. After a few moments of silence, Iyasegi sank into her seat, as if she was being softened, feet first, in a pot of boiling water. She only stopped when her back was where her bottom should have been. Ah, Yafemi, what have we done with our own hands? I told you the woman was a witch. Why was it tonight of all nights that Segi went to her room? She must have used spiritual water to wash her eyes. She must have known and forced Segi to eat the chicken. Both women looked at each other. They both knew no force was required where Segi's appetite was concerned. Did you use all of the powder? Perhaps it will not have the potency Taju said it would have. Every grain of it, as you instructed. Don't worry, I know what to do. Early tomorrow morning, I will go to the prophets in my church. They will fast and pray for three days. I am not a prophet, but God does not fail me. We will not lose a child in this household. Did you say lose a child? Do you realize what has just come out of your mouth? Iyasegi grabbed a stool by the leg. The veins around the older wife's grip were set to burst. It looked as if Iyasegi might hurl the mahogany stool. I spoke foolishly, Iyasegi, like a child without wisdom. Iyafemi said a hurried goodnight and escaped to her bedroom. When morning came, the younger children sat around the corridor and didn't seem to know if they were awake or sleepwalking. They'd woken to find Iyasegi there, as if she wasn't, head on fist, watching white clouds discolor the darkness. Iyafemi's room was locked, as was Bolanle's. Iyatope was nowhere to be found. And to top it all, their beloved Segi was gone too. Aki tried to persuade them that all was well and offered to make breakfast. But the corn pap he cooked was riddled with raw pellets that swam off the spoon. The children didn't complain. They sifted it with their teeth. After a few minutes, Aki threw down his spoon and ordered them to pour it down the sink. It was Femi who saved the day. He sat by his mother's bedroom door and yelled until his throat hurt. For once, Aki didn't try to stop him. He ran to his bedroom and pulled a pillow over his head. Before long, an anxious Iafemi surfaced and appeased the children with hot loaves of bread and tin sardines. Woken by Femi screaming, Bolanle's thoughts immediately went to Segi. She sat up and felt the stinging from the nail marks on her shoulders. Her head ached. There was a large tie-dye bloodstain on her pillow and her shoulders were dotted with blood flakes. She sat in front of the dressing table mirror and examined the back of her head with a compact. If I am not careful, I will die in this house, she thought. She cupped the clump of dried blood that clung to her hair and feathered it into the bin. Then she concealed the gash with a scarf and decided to wait for Babasegi's return before leaving her bedroom. The pickup ground the gravel and came to a halt at 7.25 a.m. Iyafemi and the children rushed to the sliding door. Babasegi's movements were slow and uncoordinated as he struggled to climb out of the pickup, followed by Iyatope, whose face was drained of all emotion. They stumbled through the door to find Iyasegi motionless in her armchair, staring but not seeing. Iyatope started pulling off her vomit-stained buba before she got to the corridor. She looked as if she'd shed her skin too, if she could. Her lips were turned down. Babasegi flopped onto his armchair like he always did. He let his eyes roll back, and then his head. He stretched out his legs before him and loosened his shoes from his feet. She is not dead. The doctors say it is food poisoning. She confessed that she drank palm wine yesterday evening. Ah, these young girls, he sighed. As for me, he said yawning, I am exhausted. His head lolled onto the headrest and he immediately began to snore like a wild hog. Iyasegi heard the snoring, yet she turned to him with eyes full of relief. All night she'd sat there, wondering if her daughter might go from the hospital to the mortuary. As tradition dictated, she would never have been able to see her daughter's face again never touch her fingers, never admire her hair. She was thankful for the news Babasegi brought, so she stood up and dragged herself to her bedroom. 
For the rest of the week, there was no laughter in the Alao household. It was as if the grieving had been pre-scheduled and therefore impossible to cancel. The older children went to the back of the house and sobbed inconsolably, while the younger children moped and sat in the corridor, refusing to wear a thread of clothing. They missed their sister, and the fact that she was lying in a hospital bed where they couldn't see her made it unbearable. They missed Segi's laughter, her comforting words, the last bites of meat she gave them. It was hardest for Aki. They'd slept in the same room for nearly ten years, and as he slunk around the house, Segi's absence swelled by the minute. He imagined that his siblings would soon begin to turn to him, and the thought frightened him. He wasn't sure he could do the things his sister did so masterfully, so he carried his loneliness around with him, with no one to turn to for comfort. Iyatope was trying to run the household, because his mother was still not herself. Iyafemi's bosom only welcomed her own children's heads. A number of times, Aki knocked quietly on Bolande's door, but ran away before she opened it. Note, Iyafemi. God has turned his face from this house. Last night, Baba Segi brought news that threw the household into anguish. He told us that Segi's hair was falling out, and that if she as much as brushed her finger against her ear, her hair dropped onto the pillow like the feathers from a fowl steeped in boiling water. To the uninformed ear, this might have sounded trivial, but in our house, it fermented the stomach content of all who heard it. Iyatope cried out first because she spent much of her time nurturing Segi's hair. She wailed that she had plaited it since she joined this household. She doesn't have much to do with her life, you see. I went to church after I heard, but I was not uplifted. The candlelit altar and the candle lighting pastor looked ridiculous. The prophet stared at my breast for so long that I had to tell him not to defile me. But it wasn't until I got home that I realized how much his evil spirit had followed me. I sent Taju to Tunde's office, but instead of bringing money to raise my spirits, he returned with a photocopied note. Following my mum's passing, I have decided to accept the position of US rep. A big thank you to those of you who made it to my mum's funeral at such short notice. For those of you that I didn't get the chance to say goodbye to, forgive me. My email address remains the same, so I look forward to hearing from you soon. Yours ever, Tunde Adebe. I ask you, what is email? And what is a US rep? Ah, God, is this your face? I could not stop the tears of anger that wet my face. I cried, so there is no grandma to parade my sons in front of. Ah, coward! She saw my triumph coming and decided to deny my victory. She begged the devil to spare her my revenge, my gloating, my head-splitting laughter. And my children, my sons, they might as well have been born to Baba Segi. Ah, all these years wasted. Ha, Tunde, so you have abandoned me without knowing your sons. Will I ever see you again? Why didn't you tell me you were going? Is that how small I was in your eyes? Did my spirit not speak to your conscience? How could I have been so stupid? It is now that I know that I am an orphan. I have no one. Who will I speak to? Who will I walk with? Iyatope does not want to know me and Iyasegi is mad with grief. Oh, every time I see her, I remember the chicken spitting in the frying pan. God, cover me with your spirit. Cover me so my enemies will not laugh at my shame. Send your angels to shield me with their wings. Avenge those who want to persecute your daughter. Rain, brimstone and fire on their heads. Do not let the devil smite me in my time of shame. Results. Bolandi. Dr. Dibia was shorter than most men, but he made up for it with a big book. He had a short afro, and his thick lenses were framed with heavy rectangular rims. When I walked into his office, he asked me to sit down and made me wait for him to finish the page he was reading. Pardon me, he said, as he inserted a tattered leather bookmark between its pages. Only then did he pick up my file to mouth every word in it. So have you brought the test results? He stretched out his hand without looking up at me and eagerly tore at the envelope with a letter opener. While he read, I glanced at his desk. All his stationery was coordinated. The letter opener, the stapler, and the staple remover were made from leather and shiny steel. Dr. Dibia summoned a nurse and instructed her to prepare me. I wondered why he avoided my eyes and concluded that he must be bashful. He muttered to himself as I lay waiting behind the white curtain. The nurse must have sensed my uneasiness because she reassured me that I was in good hands. Dr. Dibia is one of the best in the country, she said. Within a few moments, Dr. Dibia swooped the curtain aside and came at me with latex talons. He mumbled to himself as he prodded and pushed my belly. And when he moved between my legs to examine me internally, he gazed up at the ceiling and cocked his head sideways. It was only when he pressed my stomach down that he looked inquiringly at my face for wincing or grimacing. Please relax, he said. Make your knees flop sideways. Awkward though the experience was, he was gentle and there was no serious discomfort. When he was satisfied, he asked me to put on my clothes and returned to his table. From my examination, the results of the scan and the blood tests, I cannot see any immediate reasons why you shouldn't be able to conceive. You have had one termination? He lowered his frames and looked me in the eye for the first time, so he wasn't shy then. I nodded. As if his colleague hadn't already grilled me on the when, where and who, he asked me again. This time I was alone, so it was easier. 1992, 
in a small shed. A nurse, I think. A nurse? He hit the table with his fist, making everything jump. Did you hear that, sister? Hmm, yes, doctor. Sister's voice came from behind the white curtain, where she was clearing the examination table in preparation for the next patient. He looked back at me. Well, all I can tell you is that you are a very lucky woman. An unqualified person has performed a major procedure on you, and you have seemingly escaped unscathed. He looked at me for a few seconds and then softened his gaze abruptly. Well, now that you are older and no doubt wiser, I hope you won't subject yourself to such butchery again. It sounded more like an order than candid advice. I was about to tell him that I was in his office because I wanted to have a baby, not to dispose of one, when the nurse summoned him. Doctor, I think you should see this. The doctor excused himself and returned within seconds. Mrs. Alau, there are some blood stains on the examination table. Are you by any chance bleeding? He fluttered his fingers in the direction of my face to indicate that he wasn't referring to my lower region. I was puzzled for a moment, and then I reached up and touched the back of my head. It was wet. Uh, I slipped and hit my head on the floor. Uh, uh, hard? It came out like a question. Even I wouldn't have believed me. The doctor sprang up from his seat and stood over me. Do you mind if I take a look? I untied the scarf. The smell of stale blood swirled around my face and filled my nostrils. That's uh, quite a gash you've got there. Has it been seen too? No, it's just a small... Believe me, it is not a small anything. He returned to his seat. Nurse will escort you to the A&E department from here. It will need a proper dressing. There was a glimmer of sympathy in his eyes when he spoke, but it disappeared quickly. Now, back to the matter at hand. I would like your husband to come in for some preliminary tests. Do you think he can make it next Monday? I'll tell him, I said. Good. Dr. Dibia opened his appointment book and drew zigzags down the page with his finger. 10.30 a.m.? That should be fine. It is important that he comes. I am sure that he'll understand that it takes two to make a baby. <laughs> he has seven children already. I could be saucy too. Nevertheless, he handed me an appointment card. Right, straight to the A&E with you, Mrs. Alau. He said it as if he didn't trust me, like he imagined I would run off with a bloodied headscarf. The nurse appeared before he finished talking and flashed him a reassuring glance. The female doctor who treated me was sympathetic. She said the wound was infected and slowly pressed an anti-tetanus injection into my right buttock. Then she carefully shaved the hair around the wound, all the time telling me that she didn't believe in taking off more hair than was necessary. Given that I was left with only three quarters of what was on my head when I first sat before her, I wondered what styles she imagined I might comb it into. Luckily, the wound didn't require round-the-head bandaging. She dressed it and held the gauze fast with strips of surgical tape. Dr. Dibia's nurse returned with a clean scarf. Anything donated to the charity box has been laundered first, she said as she handed it to me. I left the hospital grounds, wondering if modern medicine was making a mockery of my childlessness. I didn't feel the sense of relief I should have. If there was nothing wrong with me, why was my belly not rounded and taut? Dr. Dibia must have missed something. The doctor at the ultrasound center must have missed something. I got to the gate of my parents' compound to find a heavy-duty padlock hanging from it. There were eight new doorbells on the pillar, each one labeled. Another of the landlady's modern innovations, I thought, wondering how my mother would cope with having to walk out to open the gate every time their bell rang. I pressed the bell that had a combi printed on it. My father soon appeared, dangling a bunch of keys from his forefinger. Bolanli, it is only eyes that have special powers that see you these days. His face was smeared with that mellow smile of his, and I wondered if he was truly glad to see me, or if his cheeriness was gin-induced. He normally had at least four shots warming his belly by mid-morning. I was here just a few days ago, Baba, I replied, feigning indignation at his accusation. And before then, he mockingly had his head back to take a good look at me. I am not as old as I look, you know. He liked these games. When we were children, he liked to amuse himself by making us articulate our hatred for things using new words. I loathe bread and despise onions, I would say. Lara would follow with, I just don't like mama at all, which made my father fall over laughing. The visitor game was his favorite by far. If he ever missed a visitor while he was out, he would ask us to describe them. Of course, we would rattle on about the obvious features, but Baba would ask us if the visitor's left arm was shorter than the other, or if he had a mole buried in his mustache. Our stammering greatly tickled him. He would tell us to keep our eyes peeled the next time and send us off to buy lollipops. He was the only man who could have coped with Mama. Any other would have strangled her or deserted her. Baba came to terms with his emasculation a long time ago. Anyhow, he was happy to exist without responsibilities. You are right, father. I have not been the most dutiful daughter but my life has been filled with uncertainties lately. Yes, I heard. Your mother was much distressed by it. Such ruthlessness, such callousness. Wives without the worthiness of wifeliness. It was never enough to just state something simply. For him, the more syllables, the better. And since his wife didn't seem to appreciate his soliloquies, he spent his big words on his children, 
He used them during assembly at the school where he'd taught history for 27 years, and the look of bewilderment on the pupils' faces gave him immeasurable pleasure. It wasn't that he was much of an intellectual. He just had the peculiar hobby of memorizing words in the Rogers thesaurus he had thumbed three times over. I watched Baba battle with the padlock as he spoke. I was glad Mama hadn't told him I was raped. She wouldn't have wanted me enjoying that much sympathy. Besides, she would have worried about appearing inadequate or worse, sloppy. Baba put his arm around me as soon as I stepped into the compound so I wouldn't squat to greet him. He didn't like the business of kneeling and prostrating. He said it was ungainly. He drew me close and whispered into my ear. Lara is home and a battle is raging. It's a good thing that you've come because I was beginning to think I should visit friends. We walked indoors, arms linked, and I thought how unfamiliar it felt to be so close to him. The smell of him didn't conjure any fond memories. Jin had stolen Baba from our childhood and when there wasn't any, he did what he did best. He escaped. I braced myself for Lara's resentment. Our chance meetings were never pleasant. She tried hard to offend me, but I always restrained myself. I felt sorry for her. There was a part of me that believed I'd failed her. I should have stuck up for her when Mama ripped her already fragile confidence to pieces. Mama was at it again now, but her voice didn't have the old potency. It wavered, dipping into deep somberness, and then breaking into a high-pitched urgency. Her breathing was uncoordinated and got in the way of the things she wanted to say. Lara kissed her teeth when she saw me. (laughs) So you decided to summon your favorite and gang up on me? Actually, they had no idea I was coming. I just dropped in to visit my family and see how my mother was faring. Believe it or not, I didn't know she had had a stroke until last week because no one bothered to tell me. I looked Lara in the eye and as my gaze traveled downwards, I saw an unusually rotund midsection. Are you? Yes, she is. You see what war has befallen me? She has allowed that common musician to climb on top of her and pump her full of child. Is it the fact that he's a musician that bothers you, Mama? Or the fact that I'm pregnant and not pursuing your dreams? Woe indeed. I looked from one woman to the other. Lara had inherited Mama's venom. By the time she was 17, she was taking her on in full-blown shouting matches while I hid in the next room, incapable of calming either temper. They were so alike, both determined to get whatever they wanted at any cost and stubborn as hell. Lara, that's no way to talk to your mother. Baba knew he had to say something to her before her brazenness was ascribed to his gene pool. What mother? She was never a mother to me. You think I was after her husband, the way she's victimized me. Do this, study this, go to university, only marry a man who does this. When will you stop trying to make me live the life you failed to live? Can't you just be happy with yours? I may think about stopping after I have slapped that ungrateful mouth of yours, you imbecile. Mama yelled. Slap it now, Mama. Lara shifted to the edge of her chair and turned her cheek towards her mother. Slap it as you have always slapped it. Slap it to your heart's content. Go on, slap it, jump at it. What difference has it ever made? Iyabolande, there will be no need for that. If there was one thing Baba couldn't bear, It was what he called gratuitous brutality. Every time Mama beat us when we were younger, Lara and I prayed for him to come to our rescue and ward off Mama's palm. But he would look away, unable to watch. We fantasized about him standing up to her and warning her never to inflict pain on his children. But it never happened that way. Baba would issue a quiet cautionary word and vanish, leaving his words by the wayside. Three times Mama tried to push herself off her seat, but each time she fell backwards. Her eyes were set on Lara. When she became breathless, she launched into Papa, as if her inability to lift herself was his fault. Just listen to your pathetic self. What do you know about how to bring up a child? You call yourself a father, but keep mute until all dignity is beyond us. If not for the mother who has slaved for them, where would they be today? She snorted and shook her head in disgust. Oh dear, poor Mama. Like Mama, Lara had perfected her sarcasm. Imagine, she continued, all that slaving wasted. And you thought you'd be able to dictate who I'd marry and how I'd live my life. Well, I'm sorry. I didn't ask you to slave for me. You should have done that for Bolanle alone. I could have cut Lara down to size. I could have called her a dunce and made her burst into angry tears. But instead, I chose to be sensible. The one quality she despised in me. Who is it that Lara wants to marry, Mama? And why are you so unhappy with him? Is it not a guitar player with knotted hair? He prances around in jeans that are torn at the knees. And every time he comes here, the smell of cigarettes fills the entire house. And he speaks like those uh, Jamaicans too. No man, yes man. I had to ask him yesterday, is it that I look like a man to you? And what did he do? He laughed in my face. Baba covered his mouth with his palm, but his eyes bulged with amusement. As it happens, Mama, his mother is Jamaican. Yes, he has knotted hair and smells of cigarettes. But you know what? I like him that way. And I am the one who will have to live with him. My sister scratched her belly. There was an awkward silence. Mama, there's just one thing. Everyone turned to listen to me. And I want you to consider the implications of your words before you utter them. This child that Lara is carrying, what do you want her to do to it? 
Baba, who was already putting on his shoes, stopped and sat upright. The room went so quiet that everyone heard the ticking of the wall clock. Mama looked away, sensing that she'd been cornered. Twice she made her open her mouth to speak, but closed it again. It was as if the actual existence of a child, though unborn, had only then dawned on her. This wasn't just another of Lara's frivolities, but a fetus that would one day speak, walk and laugh. And if I was indeed barren, this might be her only chance to carry a child born to her daughter. She'd sat there slicing the manhood from the father of what might be her only grandchild. She whimpered and looked from one face to the other. Even Lara could not endure the sight of Mama hitching her leg against the chair leg, like a dog scratching its belly. She crawled to Mama's feet and buried her face in Mama's lap. Mama didn't say anything. She placed her hand on Lara's head and brushed her hair back with her fingertips. When Lara returned to her seat, she looked at me and mouthed the words, Thank you. Baba brought the knuckles of both thumbs to his lips and closed his eyes. There was discomfiture at first, but before long, we were talking. We talked about the scarcity of paraffin and how distressing the queues at the garages were. We all laughed when Baba described his frustration over the endless yelping of the neighbor's puppy. He declared that he was plotting to kidnap it and dump it in a faraway village. Mama laughed so much that she held her forehead and quaked in her seat. It was a deep belly laugh with a hum at the end of it. It was an unfamiliar sound, yet I had heard it a long time ago, long before Baba developed a passion for Gordon's gin. An image came to my mind, the four of us in the same room, Mama pregnant with Lara, Baba clapping his hands, and me dancing for their entertainment. A happy family. I looked at everyone's lips and noted how their voices had suddenly become crisp, clear, and melodious, no longer the muffled echoes my ears had become attuned to. That afternoon, I said goodbye without telling Mama about Segi's illness or my hospital visit. I didn't want to raise false hopes. Things were still inconclusive, and I knew there were challenges ahead. How to tell Baba Segi about the appointment, for instance. It didn't seem the right time to bring up such things. As I started up the street, a familiar car screeched to a halt beside me. Shegun was driving and his mother was in the front seat. They honked for the guard to swing the gates open. Even though she must have been nearing 60, Shegun's mother's skin glistened like the flesh of a pawpaw sliced open. Her nose was straight and her neck long and distinguished. Aren't you one of the Akombi girls? Uh, what's your name again? She asked, pointing a slim finger at me. She spoke with her teeth clenched, so it was only her lips that moved. She didn't want to appear as if she was making any real effort. Shegun responded before I could. Her name is Bolanli. Surely you remember? His mother shot him a disapproving side glance. How is your mother? Is she better? Much better, thank you, ma. It was strange. I could look at her. I could speak to her. The panic wasn't there. There was no stuttering, and my voice came out exactly as I'd intended. Good. What do you do now? She examined her silver nail varnish, clearly not interested. She was so rich, she didn't need to do anything. She wanted to remind me of that. Nothing at the moment, but I'm thinking of getting a job. If I can't find the sort of thing I want, I'll improve my prospects by going back to university for a master's degree. Both set of eyes and the car widened. Shagun's from astonishment at my self-confidence. His mother's from cynicism. Shagun recovered first. All the best then. With that, he pushed the gear lever into first gear. His mother giggled and laughed all the way into their beautiful driveway. Her laughter rang in my ears long after she'd stopped mocking me and rubbishing my aspirations. But instead of feeling ridiculed, I felt strong and defiant. You weren't laughing the night armed robbers told you to pull your ears and do frog jumps, I said out loud. My mind immediately took me to that night when the gentle winds brought squalls of dust and everyone shut their windows, anticipating rain. It was one of those nights when, even though it was cool, everyone looked forward to sleeping with a light coverlet. Shagu had asked that I come to his bedroom that night. He was whistling the tune to Casanova, which meant the coast was clear. If things looked risky, he whistled Anita Baker's Watch Your Step. That boy has evil in him. The way he whistles behind the wall is eerie. Maybe he's communicating with ghosts in the spirit world. My mother bent her ear in the direction of the whistling. I quickly ran to my bedroom so Mama wouldn't catch my eye. I could keep secrets, but I could never tell barefaced lies. It amazed me daily that she hadn't smelt shedding on my skin or noticed how much weight I lost after the abortion. I tried hard to stop relating what had been scraped from my womb to the little humans that gurgled on their mother's backs. The relationship between the two haunted me. At the time, Shagun was already in his third year at university, and I was waiting for my acceptance letter. He often brought girls home and hid them in his room at weekends. His father liked this. He liked that his son was a virile ladies' man. His mother, on the other hand, referred to his lady friends as whores. What kind of daughter tells her parents she is going to university and then goes around sleeping in men's houses? It's disgraceful, she would say, and mop sweat off her nose with an embroidered handkerchief. That night, I changed into my pajamas and jumped under my coverlet with a Mills and Boone. I wanted everyone to think I'd turned in early, knowing Lara would follow suit. She often copied me, so it didn't appear that she lacked initiative and common sense. I was her role model, then. If only she knew. Her footsteps came after ten minutes, and she quickly mummified herself with her coverlet, dead to the world. 
I sneaked out of our bedroom and stopped by my parents' door. I listened for sounds, but there were none except my father snoring. No doubt Mama was sleeping with a pillow over her head. I unlocked the back door and tiptoed towards the drainage system at the back of the compound. I took a bucket with me to fool anyone who saw me slinking around. There were endless things a young woman could be using a bucket for, and luckily, a rendezvous with the landlord's son wasn't one of them. On our side of the fence, the concrete blocks weren't planed or painted, so I dug my toes into the ridges and climbed to the top. As I lowered myself on the other side, Shegun's guard dog licked my feet. I giggled as I landed on their manicured lawn. Shegun's door was open. He always kept it open for me. He was sitting shirtless on his bed, reading an old time magazine. He flicked cigarette ash into an ashtray he had balanced on his thigh. When he heard me come in, he put the magazine aside. Are you staying the whole night? He asked. No, I left our kitchen door open. I don't think I should risk it. You're scared. <laughs> and you're not? I folded my arms. He grunted and walked into his ensuite bathroom. There was a coral bath in the corner and a matching toilet and bidet. My father hasn't come home yet. I can't believe he's doing all this shit. Vincent saw him at the cotton club buying pizzas for two scantily dressed girls. He pushed the bathroom door open with his big toe. Does he ever stop to think how that looks? I could have been with Vincent. I could have been sitting there having a drink with my friends and we would all have seen my father walk in with a girl on each arm. He stopped talking when he started urinating and did not resume until he had shaken off the last drop. Maybe he's at a business meeting with his partners or something. I didn't like it when he was tetchy, so I thought of things that would calm his nerves. Oh, you could call it that, he spluttered. It is business for the girls, and my father is obviously a willing partner. He took up his toothbrush from the metal cup with a clang. His wit was greatly sharpened when he was irritable. I covered my mouth so he wouldn't hear me chuckling. He'll be home soon. He always comes home. Yes, he does. Dead drunk. Last week, Dawn found him in the driver's seat. He had driven into the compound, locked himself in the car, and slumped onto the steering wheel. The night guard was beside himself with worry, not knowing whether he was dead or alive or going to suffocate. Shegu brushed his teeth for a while and spat into the sink. It's a miracle he can find his way home at night. Shegu always had the air conditioner on full blast, so by the time he had shaved, I was lying under the duvet. He snuggled in beside me, and we lay there for several minutes. His mind was far away, but I found the feel of his skin comforting. His body filled all the parts where mine caved in. If sex was the price I had to pay to be close to someone's skin, it was fine by me. I waited. I knew he would speak soon. And when he did, it would be something about his father. Here he comes now, Shegun said, springing up to turn off his air conditioner. He was still frozen on the spot, listening out, when we heard two muffled gunshots, one after the other. It was obvious that they came from nearby. Shegun flew into the bathroom to get his dressing gown. I bolted, gripped with fear. I'm going out there, Shegun announced, pulling on his jeans. Don't be a fool. We should hide. My father is out there. You think he wants you to get killed? He thought for a minute, and somehow my crazy logic made sense to him. He didn't suspect that all I wanted was for him to stay with me. Where shall we hide? he asked. Outside. Let's hide outside, in case they come in. No, they could be on their way here already. This is the only way if they can't get through the front door. It's bulletproof. Let's hide in the bathroom then. We can climb into the ceiling through the tiles. I used his clasped fingers as a step, then Shegun hoisted himself after me and replaced the polystyrene tiles. There were hundreds of holes in them so we could see into the bathroom. Since the bathroom door was open, we could see into the bedroom too. Shegun grimaced when he realized we'd left the lights on. The bedroom door lock was suddenly splintered by bullets, and a short, stout man in a sleeveless football shirt kicked the door open with his foot. Bring the idiot so he can lead us to the safe, he snarled. Even though the bathroom door was wide open, he split it in half with bullets. Two men dressed in black denim dragged Shegun's father by the collar of his shirt. He could hardly walk. His face was swollen and he was bleeding profusely from a gash on his forehead. There was a dark, circular stain on his trousers and blood trailed his every step. Shegun covered his mouth with both palms. His eyes looked like they would drop out of his head. Which way? A fourth man slapped Shegun's father across the back of the head and pushed him in the direction of the veranda that led to the main building. Although I was just as frightened, I was captivated by the tears that rolled down Shegun's face. All the years I had known him, he had never cried. Not even when he took me to the nurse to abort the child he imagined was his. Even though he could see how terrified I was, he blamed me for not insisting that he went out to buy a condom. Not once did he comfort me or acknowledge the tragedy of the occasion. I reached out my hand to him, but he pretended not to see it. He wished I wasn't there. Not to save me from the terrible things I was seeing, but because he was embarrassed that I, a common tenant, was witnessing such a personal family tragedy. It was at that moment that I realized that I meant very little to him. I might as well have been another dusty wooden lintel. I thought perhaps I wasn't worthy of him. There was silence all around, but we knew it wasn't safe to come down from our hiding place. Shegun developed cramp in his legs, but he gritted his teeth. After what seemed like hours, Shegun's mother entered the room carrying a metal safe on her head. 
She was wearing a long nightdress, and one of the men in black denim kept poking her buttocks with the point of a machete. She looked around the room and went towards the outside door. On her way back from depositing the safe in her husband's new BMW, the armed robber asked her to pull at her ears and leap like a frog. She hopped as best she could in turquoise silk, egged on by a rusty iron blade. She was crying, and I could tell that her tears had nothing to do with the humiliation. She kept shuddering as if something had shaken her to her core. I knew Shedden's father was dead, but I didn't say a thing. The robbers left at 4am with thousands of dollars in cash and trinkets they'd found in another safe, cleverly tucked behind the picture of Shegun's grandmother. As soon as we heard two cars screeching up the road, Shegun dislodged the tiles and jumped to the floor. He didn't wait to help me to my feet. He just sprinted down the veranda to the main entrance. I crept out of the house and climbed back to my side of the fence. As I picked up my bucket and made for the well, I thought of the disaster I could have caused by leaving the door open. If the robbers had decided to go into our compound too, it would have been easy for them. I might as well have invited them into our home, not that we had anything of great value. I placed the bucket of water in the center of the kitchen floor and crawled into my bed. The entire house was quiet. If Mama asked me anything in the morning, I'd try to lie. I didn't need to. By the time I woke up, the entire neighborhood was grief-stricken. Every eye within the vicinity was bloodshot, and there were cars parked all the way up our street. Like all the tenants, my parents went to the landlord's house to register their condolences, but they were not allowed into the property. The house was full of dignitaries, and they didn't want paupers dirtying their Persian rugs. I didn't see Shegun for days. On the day of the funeral, I stood by our gate for hours so I could catch a glimpse of him. As the funeral cortege drove to the burial ground, he looked in my direction, but turned away when he saw me. Not a pursed lip or a raised eyebrow in acknowledgement of my vigil. Seed The traffic on Songo Road had slowed to intermittent jerking. She seems happy and restful now. Babasegi continued to his driver. The nightmares are gone. We have much to be grateful for. He was determined to embrace optimism. Taju massaged the steering wheel each time they stopped and started. There was a funeral at the local cemetery and a few young men were gathered at the gates singing dirges. Brandy was downed by the mouthful and empty bottles dotted the ground around the cemetery gate. The men had black bands tied around their uncombed hair. One of them carried a framed picture of a young man with a neat parting and a strange smile. It bore all the pretension of a studio portrait. It must have been the third or fourth pose at least. A few moments later, a university van full of young women squeezed through the traffic and deposited its occupants at the mouth of the cemetery. Cars slowed, passengers stared, their eyes full of sympathy. They knew all too well that it was important to be slightly inebriated before entering the cemetery. A little something was needed to numb the mind and dull the senses. It was no secret that the cemetery was full. Every yard of earth had been disturbed, every foot unearthed. Nevertheless, coffins went in, and gloved pallbearers came out, having left their burdens in three-foot graves. Corpses were forced into unsavory unions. Reckless men were laid to rest on chaste widows, children on top of elderly men, girls on top of women who were too young to be their mothers. Nature, in its omniscience, would not accept these copulations. The shallow graves were ravaged by dogs, and what the dogs rejected, the heavy rains, returned to the residential area on the other side of the road. As Taju drove past the cemetery gates, the clouds gathered into fists. Babasegi, who had stopped to gape at the mourners, spat out of the window. So it is the specialist who wants to see me, he asked. Yes, Bolandi said. Now that is a man who has sense in his head. He understands that a woman must have a master that she submits to. Unlike that imbecile we saw the other day, he clearly understands the significance of a husband. Bolandi decided it was better to leave things vague. It had been hard enough summoning the courage to invite him. In fact, the telling was only made possible by Babasegi's late night visit to his daughter. Is she sleeping through the night now? He'd asked as he swung the bedroom door open. Bolande was wiping beads of sweat from Segi's forehead. Speak quietly, please. She has only just fallen asleep. Babasegi lowered his voice to a whisper. Is she sleeping through the night now? No, she wakes up every few hours when the pain is unbearable. Is the medicine not working? He reached out to touch his daughter's head, but snatched back his hand, afraid he would upset her slumber. Perhaps we should take her back to hospital. He looked to Bolande for an answer. You could. But you yourself said the doctors predicted her recovery might be slow. Speaking of which, Dr. Dibia has asked to see you. He's the doctor I saw when I went for my appointment at UCH. He said it's important that he speaks to you. It went down perfectly. So you went for the appointment? He hadn't expected that she would take the initiative. Yes, and I took the results of the tests. He said it was important to see you. Tomorrow, in fact. But why didn't you tell me before? What sense does it make to treat ringworm when the body is consumed with leprosy? Segi's condition has overtaken all our minds. Baba Segi exhaled deeply. You are right. Well, if the doctor calls, then I must answer. All the diseases of the body must be treated. He tiptoed towards the door. The appointment is at 10.30. May we wake well.
a few half-truths, a few untold truths, and the deed was done. Dr. Dibia was not in a hospitable mood when Babasegi and Bolanle walked into his consultation room. He was digging the lid of his pen into his ear, as if something had jumped in when he wasn't looking, just to annoy him. Good morning, doctor. Babasegi hoped to impose his high spirits upon him. Please sit. I take it you are Mr. Alao. He looked at the clean biro top with disgust and threw it in the bin. Yes, I am the husband. He drew his hands to his bosom. And this is the wife who cannot conceive. He pointed two forefingers at Bolanli, as if there was a slight chance that the doctor might mistake one for the other. Good, good. Now that I know who's who, let me tell you why you are here. In order to arrive at a conclusive prognosis about your wife's inability to conceive, it's important that couples hoping to become parents are examined together. We've already administered some tests on Mrs. Alao, so now you need to do some initial tests too. This will help us determine how we might overcome the difficulties. He avoided using the word problems. I hope you are not trying to say that I might be the cause of these difficulties. Babasegi glanced at Bolanli, then moved his face as close to the doctors as the table would allow. Listen, doctor, I have many children. I have sons. I have daughters. The only thing God has not blessed me with is twins. Mind you, there is still time. <laughs> so tell me, he paused, are the tests you want to do on me not a waste of time? Dr. Dibia reclined into his seat and took off his glasses. He looked intently at Babasegi while his glasses swung from his finger like the wand of a metronome. Mr. Alao, did you see that queue out there? Yes, there are many people waiting outside the door. Good. Do you know why they are there? Is it not to see you? <laughs> Babasegi didn't know where he was going with this, but he was suspicious all the same. Indeed they are. But they are also there because they have a common belief. Babasegi opened his mouth to talk, but the doctor raised a solitary finger and stopped him before he started. They believe that I know what I am doing. They believe that I don't just sit here making things up. They believe that when I ask them to do something, it is because I believe it is for their own good. After all, I did not drag them here from their homes, did I? <laughs> well, <laughs> there are no wells, no buts, no arguments, no questioning of my understanding of obstetrics and gynecology. He turned to Balandi, Mrs. Alao. If you seek a solution, perhaps you can advise your husband. A sperm count has to be done. This involves us taking a sample of your husband's sperm and examining it in a lab. The hospital labs are open until 12. The sooner the sample is taken, the better. He scrawled on a yellow form and handed it to her, together with a small, transparent container. His whole manner made it clear that he'd appointed her as the go-between. Thank you, doctor. And how is the head? Much better. She patted her scarf discreetly and flashed the doctor an embarrassed grin. The Harmattan winds had been brutal the year before, and the walls were smeared with a film of warm terracotta. The windows were so high that even the exceptionally tall Babasegi couldn't survey the hospital grounds. But then, like the room, they'd been glossed over with dull off-white paint. A 20-inch TV and video sat on a mobile stand. There was a large tub of Vaseline on a shelf beneath it. Babasegi held his penis in his hand, as if it was a hefty bill he had not expected to pay. His eyes were on the man in the video, who was dipping his tongue into a woman's pubis. He was both surprised and disgusted that his member responded to what looked alarmingly like taboo. As his member grew in his hand, he squeezed hard to admonish it. But the swelling didn't stop, so he didn't stop squeezing. He watched the blonde woman gag on her partner's penis. Unthinkable! Babasegi's mouth filled with saliva. He looked from his penis to the small container. He examined his testicles and gave them a gentle prod, hoping that something would make its way out, but there was nothing but a clear trickle. When he couldn't stand it anymore, he zipped up his trousers and unlocked the door. Bolanle was still sitting on a bench at the end of the corridor, her chin pressed into the crook of her palm. A nurse sitting nearby blew gum bubbles as she thumped her way through a pile of forms. Sister, Babasegi called, decidedly opting for the less awkward conversation. Bolanle looked up, but Babasegi pointed to the nurse and motioned for her to come over. Can I help you, sir? The nurse cautiously held the door open with her foot. I can't do this. There is only one way for a man to shed body water, and that is the way I have done it all my life. I don't understand how to do it like this. I don't even know how to hold it. <laughs> Sir, it's easier than you think. The nurse wondered how it was that men, with all their talk of conquering women, had not mastered the art of pleasuring themselves. You'd think women were their dustbins. Uh, did you watch the video? <laughs> it helps. I, I couldn't bear it. How can anyone respond to that filth? He inhaled sharply and suppressed his urge to spit. Then maybe it will help if you see how it's done first. She wedged the door open with a metal coke top and marched towards the TV. She stopped the video and pressed rewind. All you have to do is copy everything the man in the video does. <laughs> Try not to think too much about what you are doing. Let your mind go to, uh, yes, let your mind go to that young wife of yours. Imagine you are with her. Silence. She pressed play and the video started. 
The nurse averted her eyes and made to leave the room. But before she closed the door, she turned and said, eh, Mr. Alau, there is some Vaseline under the TV. Some men say it happens quicker when they use it. As the nurse walked back to her desk, she popped a small pink bubble with a click of her tongue. The Vaseline was full of holes where it had been poked by desperate fingers. Babasegi scooped a little less than a handful and smeared it over the fat flap of flesh that floundered at his groin. There was a naked Chinese man in the video, and as he watched a woman dancing around a pole, the man grabbed his penis and stroked it. Babasegi followed suit. When the woman at the pole approached him, he pointed his penis in her direction and massaged firmly. Babasegi too pointed his penis in her direction and mimicked the man's movements. Before long, Babasegi's toes began to curl. He felt like he was lying on a mattress on wheels, zooming down a steep hill. The wild and wonderful build-up to the orgasm made him shudder. The man in the video told the woman to kneel down before him, at which point the expression on his face changed. He seemed to become enraged. He thrust his member into his half-open fist and rolled his eyes to the ceiling. Babasegi would have emulated him had his own eyes been open. He had dreamt up his own fantasy, Bolanle naked, on her knees, begging for his seed. As the man in the video erupted all over the dancer's face, Babasegi, who had never had the need to aim, added his own splodge to the far wall while the container lay patiently beneath his testicles. As his breathing returned to normal, he looked around, not knowing what to do. If it is seed they want, they will get it, he said to himself. He waited for coordination to return to his fingers and then used the rim of the container to scrape the last dribbles of semen from the tip of his penis. He secured the lid and sat back down. What would teacher say if he saw me here, heaving like a pursued diker? What would Taju say if he heard that I, Chief Alao, was filling a plastic container with my body water? What would Iyasegi say if she saw me whipping myself? One by one, the looks of disappointment on the faces of family, friends and employees tormented him. When he'd worked his way through everyone, he straightened his clothes with moist palms and fled the room, the video, the dancer and the memory of what he had done there. Just outside, Bolani was pacing the corridor. Is it done? she asked, more concerned about the sperm sample than the patches that had merged into one at his crotch. I have done the best I can do, Babasegi couldn't look her in the eye. When they returned to Dr. Dibia's consultation room, Bolanle knew there was something going on. The bubble-blowing nurse had rushed the results back to the doctor in a sealed envelope. But rather than invite his patients in, Dr. Dibia scurried out, open envelope in hand, forcing his arms into the twisted sleeve of his lab coat. A few minutes later, he returned with a better-groomed Dr. Usman in tow. It was the look that Dr. Usman gave Bolanle that gave it away. He may not even have known that a look had passed between them. All he'd meant to do was glance at her, but he squinted and rearranged his lips so they formed a straighter line. It was definitely a look, a sympathetic one. Back in Dr. Dibia's consultation room, the debate on Babasegi's fate was well underway. I think telling him would put the women in his household at risk. She came in with a nasty gash on the back of her head last week. But we don't know that he did that. I didn't pick up on any domestic violence. He seemed more possessive than aggressive, you know, more of a lover than a fighter. Well, as far as he's concerned, it's his wife who's got serious problems. It would have been a different matter if he had a low sperm count. But there's nothing, not a solitary sperm swimming around. Probably had mumps in his teens. I'll bet any money he's never had a vaccination in his life. Dr. Dibia wrapped the table with the tips of all eight fingers. He wasn't interested in Dr. Usman's betting. He wanted to know where to go from where he was. This just doesn't add up. I think I need to talk to his other wives. Uh, yep, that makes sense. Just say it's part of the investigation. He can't argue with that. So you agree that I shouldn't tell him the results yet? I think that's reasonable. Dr. Usman stood up, eager to return to his own department. But what about the girl? Doesn't she deserve to know? A few more days won't do her any harm. With this, he waved and shut the door behind him. Bolanle and Babasegi found themselves in the same chairs they'd sat on that morning, except now the air conditioner was on. The smell of the cheap lemon air freshener filled the room. Bolanle immediately noticed that there was a marked difference in Dr. Dibia's demeanor. He was now disturbingly well-mannered. As soon as Bolanle saw him stand up to receive them, she expected the worst. She looked at Babasegi to see if they were thinking alike, but he was sleepily scratching dry saliva from the corners of his lips. He had nodded off outside Dr. Dibia's consultation room. The doctor flashed eight small teeth. The investigation is incomplete, he began. Babasegi was immediately riled by this statement. His nostrils flared and his eyes resembled overpowered torches. Even the gods could not make me repeat that. That, that immoral act. I will not. He snapped his fingers over his head in defiance. That's quite all right, Mr. Alao. I'm not asking you to provide another semen sample. In fact, I don't need anything else from you. Not for now, at least. It is your other wives we need to see, or maybe just one of them. You choose. Maybe he'll respond to empowerment, Dr. Dibia thought. Why? You have seen Bolanle. You have seen me. 
Why do you need to see another wife? Papa Segi decided to play hard to get. He wanted to get his own back for the doctor's earlier discourteousness. Well, you know, before you wrap leaves around liquidized beans, you must ensure that the ingredients are complete. Indeed, or you would be left with a plain lump of moi moi. <laughs> Baba Segi completed the saying. Dr. Dibia smiled. The traditional shit always worked on the older farts. Oh, well, exactly. Consider the invitation I am extending to your wives as a boiled egg. <laughs> not a half, not a quarter, but a whole one, which will complete this bounteous recipe. <laughs> Doctor, I see you like good things. I too like the very best for my stomach, and I will bring you the wife who sees to it that that is what I get. Baba Segi beamed. Write down her name, Mrs. Labake Alao. <laughs> Perhaps on Wednesday? I normally teach on Wednesdays, but I could squeeze her in at 9.30. He handed the appointment card to Baba Segi. See you on Wednesday. <laughs> and please, don't leave that wonderful wife of yours at home. It was meant as a joke, and it was received as one. Baba Segi go forward all the way down the newly mopped corridor, all the way down the narrow stairs, and all the way back to the pickup. Baba Segi I remember a saying from my childhood. Only a foolish man falls into a trap prepared with his own hands. It is because of what happened to my father that these words were on everyone's lips. My father was a hunter, but he'd caught his foot in the snare he'd laid for an antelope. They say he heard the squawk of a wild guinea fowl and ran after it, forgetting what was in front of him. His ear led him to an early death. He was barely twenty. He didn't wait to see my face or hold my little feet. He died lashing about at the bottom of a burrow. They say he was already buried when they found him. There was no point in digging him up to bury him again, so they just shoveled more earth over his corpse. No other man would marry my mother, for they feared that they might also die in a grave intended for a lesser beast. But they were all lesser beasts, all unworthy of her. My mother tied fabric and dyed it indigo. The soles of her feet were always black, and as a child, I would sit for hours removing the black residue from her toenails. By the time I was twelve, I wished she would cut off her toes. Not because I hated her, but because my arms ached, and Mama was never satisfied. I think she just liked me to touch her feet. When I was seventeen, I prayed that the gods would forgive me for all the evil thoughts I had ever had about my mother because without her, I would not be here today. She was a mother of mothers to me. She nursed me through an illness that reduced me to an infant. I lost my ability to walk or talk. They said it was my father's spirit that had come to take me, but I knew that was a lie. Why would any father want to do that? It all started with a headache. I was fetching firewood from the forest one day, when my head started to throb at the awuje. It was as if the bones that had merged were being forced apart. I managed to stagger home. My mother had her hands deep in dye, but when she saw me coming, she ran to my aid. If she hadn't, I would have broken my skull on a stone. She carried me into our house and laid me down on a mat. My body was covered in dye, but I didn't know it. It was as if a witch had set my belly on fire. With every hour that passed, the flames rose to my throat. They say I screamed fire until sleep smothered it. It was when I realized my trousers had been changed that I knew another day had dawned. My t-shirt had not been touched, and when I looked in the small mirror in the corner of the room, I understood why. It looked like I had stuffed two mangoes in the curve where my neck meets my face. So swollen was my neck that my mother sighed every time she laid eyes on me. The way my daughter is now, that was the way I was for weeks, of no use to myself or anyone. There were days when my eyes would close from pain, rendering me deaf and dumb. My legs would curl like caterpillars, and my arms would have nothing to do with me. My mother would frantically bathe me in cold water, only to stand at marvel when steam began to rise from my head. I have been where Segi is now, and I know the only thing that will save her is the arm of one that she chooses. That was how it was for me. It was my mother I wanted. I hope you understand why I didn't discourage her from sleeping in Balanle's room. True, no one can love a daughter like her mother. But illness is not only about motherly devotion. It is about the choices of she who ails. Anything different could hasten Segi's journey to the gods. I will not bury my own child. Help me say amen. Back to my own illness. Mama said there was a spirit that sneaked behind the door every time she entered the room. She said she could feel its presence. She whispered in my ear that the smell of her husband's sweat was unmistakable so she called the medicine man to come and banish it. Do not let him take my son from me, she pleaded. Let him return to his resting place. She knew the dangers of calling a spirit by its name. The old medicine man whispered to the cowries and threw them into the center of the cloth they came wrapped in. Mm, this spirit has come for revenge. But what have I done to anger it? It is not you, it is the boy. What has the boy done? He walks on his grave like the chief who strides the palace and neglects to pay his respects to the king. But the boy does not even know where he was buried. The men refuse to take even me there. It is not your place or mine to question the spirits. Tell your son to abandon the forests, or he will leave the land of the living. And as soon as he is of age, send him away from here to protect his own unborn sons. I have heard your words, and they are full of wisdom. 
Take these yards of cloth for your wives. My mother handed him a pile of beautifully embroidered tie-dyed fabric. As soon as he stooped through the threshold, my man knelt beside me and held my right hand in both of hers. Son, did you hear the words of the wise man? Only some, I said, but I'd heard everything. Then listen, soon you must go far away from here. Go to Ibadan, where forests are few and palaces are plentiful. Go far from these roots that threaten to knot themselves around your feet and drag you into their tombs. The swelling around my neck went down within weeks. I swore to my mother that I would never go to the forests again, not to fetch firewood, nor even to hunt. But they say a hunter's child is not trained but born. Though I resisted, the leaves of the forest beckoned to me. The roots formed a path and branches begged me to perch upon them. Before I knew it, I was pressing my ears against solemn trees, listening to the hoot of guinea fowls I would never set eyes on. My disappearances did not go unnoticed. My mother heard my feet stomping on the doorstep and knew straight away that I was disobeying her. One day, she tied a wad of notes in a handkerchief, placed it in my pocket, and sent me off to Ibadan with good wishes for the journey. I was to work as an apprentice in a store where they sold plumbing materials. I worked for many years, not knowing the scent of women, until the spirit of Ayikara found me and sucked me into its belly. That is how I met teacher, the noble one whose rays of wisdom have guided me through darkness. If the gods took the form of men, they would fight for teacher's body. It was he who told me that I should return home and marry the woman my mother had found for me, lest the women of Ayikara make my blood bitter with their bile. It was teacher who pointed me in the direction of the medicine man, when it seemed Iasegi's back would be permanently gummed to our matrimonial mat. Within months, she was forced on her side, her belly bulbous like the back end of an earthen pot drunk on rainwater. Segi, my daughter, was named by my mother. My mother looked into her face and died a contented death. Lust points its finger at every man, and soon after I married, the women of Aikara began to look like princesses and goddesses. I was happy to have these women on the side, but teacher said, Two women at home are better than ten in a bush. The women of Ayikara are Jezebels. A man whose house is full of birth will never want for mirth. And this from a man whose penis, they say, has never known the moistness of a woman. You see, the gods are always merciful. What they took away from the bottom, they added to the top. The man is full of wisdom. I took a second wife, a peace offering from a desperate farmer. I took the third because she offered herself with humility. What kind of human being rejects the fullness of a woman? Would the gods themselves not have been angered if I had foregone the opportunity to show mercy to another human being? But I chose Bolande. I cannot lie. I set my mind on her, the way a thirsty child sets his eyes on a cup filling from a spout. Teacher said I was right to possess her. He bought me two shots of whiskey and patted me on the shoulder. Not a fleck of jealousy, not a speck of envy. I tell you, the man is to be admired.